welcome everybody to this final um, Pediatric Southwest Thames Network and the Bidet Network webinars for transition. Um, as you know, there's been a series of six running throughs from about November. We had an introductory session initially, and then we've spent the uh, rest of the sessions breaking down the transition QI process and also looking at transition toolkits. So for those of you, I think I recognise most names on the call, um, but just in case there are anybody new here, I'm Stella Carney and I'm the Regional Nurse Advisor for Transition for the South of England, covering the South East and the South West. And um, my usual sidekick uh, is Nigel Mills, who covers the London region. Um, but Nigel retired last week after, gosh, nearly 20 years in transition, I think it was, there or thereabouts. Louise has known him for a long time. Um, so, yes, he can't join us today because he's busy rocking in his rocking chair in his sunroom. So, and he keeps reminding me of that. So there we go. But I'm really, really pleased and privileged actually um, for us to be joined by Louise Porter today, who's the National Lead Nurse for Transition with the Bidet National Nursing Network. Um, Louise has been absolutely instrumental in creating uh, not just this network, but the QI project that we have been um, pulling apart and utilising all through our sessions. So um, um, welcome, Louise. I'm so thrilled that you can be here today and welcome everybody um, who has been able to join us. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, Louise's work um, as we go through the presentations. But in the meantime, um, we thought we would have a, a quick recap on the Slidos that we have un undertaken as part of the previous sessions, just to see what the th common themes and ideas were and, and probably the common challenges that have been highlighted throughout the sessions. So if I can hand over to Sara, she's just going to bring you through what those themes and thoughts are. Yeah. So throughout all the webinars, we've asked a multitude of different questions asking around um, some way around asking about your challenges that you're experiencing through each stage, as well as um, the sort of support that you need um, to deliver a better transition or adolescent health service. Um, and I've tried to get sort of extract the ones that were most commonly noted um, and sort of group them up together to, to try and figure out what we want to do with all this moving forward. Um, there was some, and none of this will come to a surprise to anyone here, I, I know. But um, so there's things around engaging with adult services and, and forming um, transition clinics, um, having a youth service, business planning or cases for transition needs and commissioning overall, um, as well as engagement um, with trusts, with ICBs, and just trying to encourage collaborative working. Um, and there was also a fair amount talking about how they just want a place to network and peer support each other, um, which is what we hope to really achieve through um, a sort of transition forum following um, these QI webinars. We don't want the momentum to really stop here and, and we want there to be a place for everyone um, to discuss and share learning and and try to engage with, with each other about that and support each other with it all. And then the education and training aspects of it would, I mean, we'd appreciate, of course, more feedback as to what that specifically is referring to. Um, is it communication? Is it something else around um, complex patients or learned disabilities, etc.? Um, but so there's still there's still plenty there's plenty here and there's plenty that we can actually do. Um, we have, for example, in terms of business cases or business planning, we've had someone um, we've already had a sort of a webinar on that from the SCPN, just an overarching one, um, where someone came in and talked about how how the pro what the how the what the process is around business planning um and we can do something similar like that but for transition specific things if if that's something that people would want to do um as well as just showcasing where there's best really good practice um and sharing documents or, or ways of working that could um could be utilized elsewhere um because often i think sometimes the the simplest thing of just sharing something can be um can make can be a quick win essentially um 
there's things I think around adult services I know is an ongoing issue and it's something that has come up so many times and in so many different meetings outside of this QI webinar and that's always going to be an ongoing challenge I imagine but we are engaging with ICBs about it we are talking about it so as, as the STP and we're having regular meetings with our ICBs across Kent, Surrey, Sussex, South West and South East London um, on a regular sort of every other month basis and it's mentioned there and we talk about it time and time again so hopefully um, as we go forward and we have the right people in the room to discuss these sort of things and figure out what it is that we need um, from adult services specifically or what we need from ICBs with regards to that, that would be a way forward because we'll have a joint voice um, and then that will hopefully lead to the sort of bottom bit, the darker bits as you can see about forming transition clinics, commissioning and working collaboratively etc. But of course, like I said, an overarching thing that has come up time and time again when we've asked about what you need from SCPN in our slider questions was around networking. So if anything, we'll allow the opportunity for people to peer support with one another um, over this, because especially since Stella's not going to be around, we need you guys as our transition experts um, to try and help one another and those who are interested and engaged with trying to improve transition for their patients um, they'll need support as well not just you know us trying to improve our own but just some people who will be, who will be starting at very little um, I don't know if Stella you want to say anything else yeah, and just to say that I think this is a really um, useful um, synopsis, essentially, because I think everything that is there on the screen, everybody on the call is probably feeling in one way or the other. But I think since the start of the project and certainly um, since the start of the Bidet Network, some of these um, aspects are being eroded away. And there does seem to be a an overwhelming swell now of activity. And so one of the things I wanted to pick up, Sara, was that the networking and peer support aspect um, is proving really crucial. Obviously, this collaboration in itself is proving to be invaluable from um, in terms of networking and getting that um, overall common goal of reaching that gold standard and so we all know what that looks like now um, but where there is peer support networks across the south of England particularly um, and I know there's a good few people on the call that absolutely works fabulously in creating that groundswell making you feel that you're not necessarily alone with all of these challenges because we recognize that transition can be really challenging at times but you're not on your own and there is a groundswell with particular areas Areas. And I'm thinking that there's somebody on the call that's looking at the complex um, learning disabilities and complex needs young people. And it's about keeping up with this um, network now in order to learn and share off each other because there's, there's, as I say, bubbles of areas that are growing more and more. So I think that's a great piece of work, Sarah, and I, and I would implore you um, moving forward that you do keep some sort of regular communication up so that you can create that that swell and keep that peer support group up as well yeah definitely so, with no further ado go then shall i take over yep perfect you coming through Okay, Sarah, can you see the screen? Yep, I can see it. Marvellous, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, we uh, are here today uh, to look at the final session of the Bidet and South Thames Paediatric Network Collaborative Events for Transition. Um, we have had five previous sessions and today is to culminate those to look at what the learnings are and look at the top line take home messages for each of those sessions so that you can take them away and either look at them in their entirety or, or actually look at different aspects individually um, through this this one particular webinar or then you can have a, a deep dive into the previous webinars that we've had that look at each section of the quality improvement process in, in more detail. So first and foremost, as I say, I'd love to um, highlight to you just who we are and reiterate who we are and how what in significance Louise's role has within this. So as you know, we're a network of 
um, five. Louise is our um, lead nurse for transition and we were, I was joined by three other regional nurse advisors for the country all with different skill sets and different walks of life that could bring a different level of expertise into different areas. But Louise's role particularly um, was integral in building the QI process that we have been working through for the past uh, six months. So Louise led an, um, a, a model of care within Leeds Teaching Hospital, uh, which worked incredibly well and was actually commended by the CQC. And as a result, the Bidet Network awarded one of its biggest rewards for um, any sort of um, commissioning, if you like, um, to Louise and the team to have a three year project to embed that quality improvement process into organisations and map and create networks for transition across the country as well. And the overall aim of that was simple it's what everybody on this call wants to do and it's to improve the experience of young people aged 11 to 25 with a long-term condition and improve the experience of their families and carers as well which is imperative and ultimately it was to make sure that we um, impact on the long-term outcomes and achievements and life aspirations and goals from an objectives point of view for this collaboration in particular um, we had the, the objectives that you see on the screen there. So it's to provide organisations such as yourselves with access to expert knowledge in transition. And we've, we've got that um, in abundance here today because you've, you've all um, become experts within your fields as well. And to introduce that nationally recognised QI process and as two networks to actually develop a collaboration across the South Thames region and the wider region as a whole for a, a national transition nursing network as well. But why are we doing this? And, and you know, let's just go back to basics and um, let's remind ourselves just what transition is and what transition isn't. So we know that it's a process that is evolves over a considerable amount of time and it certainly can't be considered um, a single event. And it is about moving young people from child centre care into adult uh, services. And it's over the uh, full age spectrum between 11 and 25. We also recapped our, in the early days of these sessions on why it's just so important and what the benefits are. So we're all here today to make sure that we empower young people. And, we, and if we get the transition process right, then that's exactly what we do for them. And in turn, that reduces the likelihood that the young person will be lost to follow up. And we know that that's absolutely embedded in the uh, long term plan as well. So it is a role, responsibility and part of the governance for transition moving forward. So, you know, we all need to make sure that um, we get it right, essentially. It also reduces the likelihood of complications. And if we can do that, then we're going to reduce the, the cost to the NHS. But really, most importantly, and certainly for me, um, and I'm sure all of you as well, is that it improves the morbidity and mortality outcomes for young people. And we, we can't do better than that, essentially. But what if we get it wrong? Um, what does it mean for young people if we get it wrong? Well, essentially, it creates a tremendous amount of anxiety and really unnecessary distress for young people and their families and carers, essentially. And obviously, it results in that poor compliance and treatment and more frequent visits to hospital. And what we're seeing more and more, if it happens, is poor engagement with not just health services, actually, but all services, um, including social um, and family services, which is having a real knock on effect on young people's um, engagement and mental health um, in particular. So all in all, it is contributing to those additional increasing health costs and poor mortality and morbidity outcomes. So as a network, um, we and uh, the South Thames Paediatric Network really um, decided that we couldn't let that happen. And what we wanted to do is provide a platform to support you as organisations and providers to create those best practice principles of transition within your own organisations. So we ran a series of sessions starting, um, well, actually back in November of, um, for a launch session, um, and then in, in Jan it, yeah, there, so late November, and it, it incorporated looking at where the process had come from in the beginning, um, a breakdown of future process uh, sessions, what the Bidet offer was in terms of one-to-one -one coaching and QI principles, 
and identifying actions for individual organisations to um, actually embed the process. So we, we had at the launch of the next steps scenario, if you like, or the call to action at each of these sessions as well. Um, January, we looked at the key documents that govern uh, transition and we looked at a project plan and actually how to get started and also started looking at some of the um, transition toolkits and Nigel very much delivered um, an element of a transition toolkit to utilise in each of the sessions as well. And then in February, um, we looked at looking at that real stakeholder analysis and then got looking at um, the Ready, Steady, Go tool as well. Session four last time looked at the implementation of this. So what do we need to actually implement this QI model and what skills and knowledge do we need in terms of transition leadership to make that happen? And again, looking further, Nigel looked at transition toolkits um, across the, the world, actually, which we can recap on as well. So. This is really uh, where we started is to look at what the national guidelines were utilize to, for us to utilize to embed that best practice so we started the sessions to actually identify what those those uh, actual models were so this is a, a, a synopsis of them and then we looked at each of them in detail and i think what we do need to remember is at this moment in time it's the nice quality standards that actually govern and inform what it is that we want to do to embed quality, effective and sustainable transition services into each of our organisations. So I won't go through these in detail, but these slides will be available to you, um, for, as I say, for you to um, recap on. And the sessions are being recorded, as we mentioned at the beginning of the these um, sessions as well. And so you, you will be able to look at these on um, the Futures platform moving forward as well. But the over, overarching standards are there to depict that we need to start transition early. We need to provide young people with annual review meetings. We should have a named worker for young people before, during and after their transfer into adult services. And they should be afforded to meet a practitioner for each of the services that they will be involved with moving forward. And we know that for young people with complex needs, that could be multiple practitioners as well, which is daunting in itself, essentially, when you've had one paediatric consultant, potentially, that's been looking after all of your health needs uh, so far. What we also do know is that in order to stop this cliff edge and to make sure we don't lose people at that transfer stage, we have to ensure we've got a really robust DNA process. And so if young people don't attend their first point appointment, we give them further opportunities to engage into healthcare services. And unlike the adult world, where there's almost like a one strike and you're out, we need to afford them multiple opportunities as well. And so the overarching principles of the NICE guidelines are there and fundamentally it is to make sure that we work collaboratively between children's and adult services. We have to work together and I know that some of the things that we've seen in the Slido say that that's really difficult to do. Hopefully as the presentation goes on and some of the work that Louise is doing and has done with NHS England will actually um, serve to alleviate some of those issues. But we do need to bring them along with us in adult services when we are developing them, because we know that when we do something to and for somebody, they don't necessarily adopt it. But if we do something with them and in collaboration with them, then they're more likely to actually engage into what it is that you're trying to, to do. And if we actually create joint mission statements with that, then that actually uh, serves to embed that even further as, as well. In terms of what else informs our best practice, then we need to look at things like the Your Welcome Pilot criteria, um, which includes accessibility, publicity, confidentiality, confidentiality and consent, as you can see here. And so that uh, is something that actually should inform our processes uh, of developing transition services. And it's it, it's about all age 
continue in healthcare as well. So the Northumbria model was highlighted in the early sessions for people to look at that looks at developmentally appropriate healthcare. And it's a toolkit um, that can work for everybody from clinicians to chief executives to promote the health of young people and play their part in making healthcare work for this, this age group, uh, which is obviously our passion as well. So there's many different documents out there that look at different aspects of um, the continuing healthcare uh, and also different pockets of um, or different cohorts of, of young people. So the Together for Short Lives was highlighted in the early days as well. And this document has recently been updated. So the stepping up document has been updated. And this is a guide to enable a good transition to adults and young people with life, life limiting and life threatening conditions. And also we need to make sure that we're being inclusive when we look at transition. So we need to make sure that uh, we're following the guidelines and the principles of best practice within the SEND guidelines as well. And again, that has recently been updated. So that's the background as to where we are. So that was what transition is, what best practice should be and the benefits of transition and what the national guidelines so far say that we should be um, utilising um, to embed those quality um, processes in our services. We do know that there are is further governance um, frameworks and um, assurances to come through and that's something that Louise is going to cover um, when she comes on a little bit later on. But I'd love to now, if I can, just do a whistle stop tour of that quality quality improvement model process that we went through over the past six sessions to really pull out what the key aspects and the take home messages are for each uh, individual stage of that. So I, I'm not going to dwell too much on the slides because I say these are going to be available, but it is really just to recap of you know, why we've gone through this process and what we've gleaned from it and how you can use it for the future. So as a process, it's a, it's a quality improvement model that I'm sure won't be um, unfamiliar to you, especially for everybody who's been able to join us throughout the six sessions. Um, but it looks at stakeholders, diagnostics, solution design and implementation. And obviously, importantly, where we're here today is about sustaining those services as well. So our first session looked at um, stakeholders and with that the first port of call is to make sure that we can identify stakeholders for the transition services and that's wide and varied and we know because transition covers health, education, um, housing, you know, everything within that young person's life that the stakeholder list can be absolutely huge. So, but we do need to do that process to say who needs to be round the table essentially. And from that point, then we can deliver um, the working groups um, and then it really importantly create that stakeholder analysis. And we talked about it during the session that that stakeholder analysis should look at the enablers for, st for stakeholders. So who think about who has the power and the influence, who can actually make a difference um, and actually bring them along so that, you know, they can actually be um, part of selling the whole uh, concept for the future. But also look at perhaps the gatekeepers or the barriers, um, not necessarily individuals, but potentially processes or what's occurring in within your organisations that could prevent progression um, moving forward for a transition uh, process. And so we talked about creating this stakeholder analysis grid, looking at on the uh, left axis, who has that power and that high influence? And then on the bottom axis, who has got that really overwhelming interest and, and passion about making a difference and has that high level of um, influence as well? And then that actually mapping individual, um, not people, but but roles within that stakeholder grid um, as well. So that's really important. So the key points within the stakeholder analysis aspect was to cover, uh, consider both internal and external stakeholders, make sure that we're including adult and children's services and identifying who those influencers and those barriers to prog progression moving forward are. And then it's about making sure that we create those focus group with clear action plans, with 
ro roles and responsibilities and timelines of how the work is going to be um, actually brought to fruition. But the next stage then looked at the diagnostic and solution design ideas. And this is where we actually map our services. And we need to look at the current state of the services um, for transition in order to develop what the future state looks like. So this is um, a, a process that is imperative in the early days for you to think about where you are now in, in terms of service provision and actually where you want to be for the future. So you might think to yourself within the future state, well, we can only get to this point. Really, what we need to be looking at is what that gold standard is, even if you feel like you can't get there. If we want to reach that gold standard, we've got to reach for the stars, essentially. And it's part of the next process that we'll we'll decide how we're going to get there, essentially. So the, the current state involves thinking about who is involved in developing the services in the first place. So we've, we've looked at the stakeholder analysis to do that. Um, and really looking at the minutiae of what your service looks like now. Thinking about the policies and processes that, that are in place, what the follow-up is, what documentation is being used, and what environment is actually being created for young people within your um, services, and what that really should look like based on the your welcome criteria. And so to really understand the um, current state, we need to do some benchmarking, which I know everybody on the call is probably groaning at because it feels like a really daunting, daunting task. But we have developed a tool alongside with the University of Surrey, who piloted um, this, this body of work um, and created a toolkit for benchmarking for transition, which um, in the early days when you do the first two factors feels like it takes a long time, but quite often then the information that you've gleaned from those two factors can be utilised in future um, factors as well. So it really is important that we do it. And when the University of Surrey piloted this, the groups actually gave the following comments on in terms of why it is so useful. Um, so the benchmarking tool provides a focus for discussion between children's and adult services. So this is one tool that might be really useful for you if you are finding it difficult to engage um, between services, because if you're, you're all working off the same platform and identify what's going well and what's not going well, then it, you can identify those gaps as children's and adult services and see how what the commonalities are and where you both need to work moving forward. And it actually forms a more formal part of um, transition services. So um, lots of people think they might be doing transition right or think they might think things are working well. But when you benchmark, actually, you see just what it is that perhaps is missing from your services. So you can, again, reach for that, that goal standard. So the benchmarking um, tool incorporates eight different factors looking at all elements of transition for a young person. So it's about managing that move from uh, of a health condition as an adult, so how that young person can actually um, take ownership and responsibility for their own health and well-being. Um, it's about supporting gradual transitions and coordinating with adult, child and adult teams and making sure that it's a young person friendly um, approach as well. And the latter factors look at how we're actually going to evidence that, what's the written documentation um, with that, and actually um, how do we prove that we're adopting best practice? And if it's not written down, then we're not going to be able to, to do that. Really importantly, the benchmarking incorporates the parental side of things as well, because we know that we're not just trans transitioning young people throughout this process. We're actually transitioning their parents and or carers who have held such autonomy and passion to get their their children and young people to this point in their lives. It's really difficult to to let go unless they're um, supported through that process as well. So parental involvement is absolutely imperative as well as well. The seventh factor looks at the assessment for readiness. So in, in historically, 
people or organisations have put a deadline on when a young person needs to be transitioned into adult services, normally around the 16 to 18 mark. But best practice here really should look at the readiness of that young person. And if, if they appear ready, but then go into adult services and disengage, then we need to revisit that as well. And lastly, really importantly, because um, these um, group of professionals are consistent throughout their life's lifelong um, health care, is the involvement of, of um, GPs as well. So essentially, all eight of those documents allow you to document, uh, or elements, should I say, factors, allow you to consider what poor practice is within your organisation, if it's there, or what that best practice would be. And then within those benchmarking um, documents, there's actually somewhere you can actually write down what it is that you're doing. Um, and it's at this point you can probably highlight uh, where you're achieving best practice, perhaps in black, and then any areas of shortfall you can highlight in red. And then that would form the basis of your gap analysis. They're going to form the priority um, elements of transition service development that you're going to need to focus on. So when we're looking at gathering good practice, there should be um, real scrutiny within your own organisation as well. But also look at different specialties and also specialties outside of your organisation. And that might mean looking at specialist centres across the UK. I'm thinking within diabetes or epilepsy or the core 20 plus five um, subjects in, in particular. And also, you know, we are just one nation. There's some tremendous work that goes on across the world in terms of transition. And I know that Nigel presented a, a couple of things in terms of transition tools that we'll touch on shortly as well. So it, it's looking at what's happening um, elsewhere in the world as well. And certainly the ethos of this network is to say, well, perhaps we should be looking at buddying up services and organisations to learn off each other. So think about who the stakeholders are within other organisations and think about the commonalities of, of uh, and net what they have learned um, essentially. So that we're actually looking at developing outstanding practice within our own organisation and that in turn can be shared within the region and nationally uh, as well. So once we have looked at that current state, we've looked, we've done that benchmarking um, approach, we've looked at um, the, where we want to be for the future, this is the future state. And this allows us to develop those best practice pathways. Um, and that might be utilising um, a transition tool such as Ready, Steady, Go. And we're going to touch on the, on the tools in a second. Um, and it also forms part of where we need to be um, in terms of um, agreeing new roles and responsibilities, looking at the skills and knowledge we're going to need. And again, there's going to be support and uh, guidance from a national perspective on that front as well. And actually how we communicate um, this throughout the process. So this is the implementation stage um, leading on from that gap analysis that we've talked about. And it's about rolling out this path, these pathways in a collaborative um, and all embracing with an all embracing approach, essentially. And the key principles of implementation should be that we we really scrutinize that gap, gap analysis, identify what work streams are required. So is it from a leadership point of view, training and development or, or um, pathway development? as I mentioned, what skills and knowledge we're going to need, training and education, etc. So we, we looked at those in a little bit more detail last time. So when we're looking at implementation, we discussed um, that we need to identify the skills and knowledge required for those future state transition programmes to be embedded for patients and families. And with that, we would need to do a, a gap analysis of what those skills and desired knowledge uh, would be. Once we know what it is that we need to do in terms of training and education and we've got those pathways in principle, then we need to look at how we're actually going to communicate that and bring people along rather than just it being a dump of information and expecting everybody to roll with it. So we need to gain feedback on good practice from elsewhere. We need to communicate that future state and those pathways really, really well, but really importantly, identify those roles and responsibility and assign those roles and responsibilities and create those work streams um, within um, each of the stages to make sure we've got an action plan of how it's going to be implemented. 
And so in terms to do that, we, we do need to train and educate people. Um, and so we're going to create that training program, look at identifying the methods of training, look at how it's going to be implemented and ensure, I uh, know this is a really difficult part of things, that the, there is time allocated to do that, which is really difficult in the acute world, I know. But we need to get all of that right, essentially, in, in order to be able to roll out those new pathways. Um, and um, to do that, we probably need to think about a formal start date for those, those roles and responsibility um, and identify those delivery groups and actually build a really robust communication um, strategy and start date as well. So once we've done all this, we're going to need to sustain it, essentially. Um, so to do that, we need to look at the assurance and governance and sustainability aspects or scrutiny um, to do that. We know that any QI process um, cannot be a one-off event, much like transition. It needs to be cyclical. So we need to revisit where we are at each stage of this um, moving through as well. So, you know, a PDSA um, cycle is probably um, the most useful tool for that to make it, it sustainable. We need to develop um, key performance indicators to identify uh, if the transition services that we've developed are working and uh, if they're working well or if there are pitfalls and we're, you know, we're falling short of reaching those cold, cold, uh, gold standards. So we should be looking at annual reviews of the outcomes and measures that we've set within those key performance indicators, look at patient experience and engagement measures and make sure we get hearing the voice of the young people um, and look at annual pathway review and design as well. And this can't be one person's job, even if there is a transition lead within an organisation. We know that we need to um, make sure that we're all responsible and each um, uh, area of our practices is, is scrutinised. And so it might be that somebody's responsible for looking at bi-monthly reviews of the data of uh, patient numbers, for example, of those young people reaching the age of transition or reaching the age of uh, transfer. Um, who perhaps do or don't have a transition plan in place. So these are all key performance indicators that we should consider. And this is, again, I'm not going to go through each of these, but this is the sort of things that perhaps you could utilise. So it's a transition key performance ind indicator mind map that you might want to um, take hold of to, to look at what the benchmark standards are and how things are looking within you as a whole organisation, overall or service specific KPIs as well. So that really is a whistle stop tour of what we've covered in terms of the QI process. And then I did want to touch, although Nigel's not here, he um, was uh, phenomenal in sharing his experience in how transition toolkits can actually form the absolute basis of embedding the correct and effective transition um, services and the right approach, developmentally appropriate healthcare approaches um, to young people in your services. So he covered a, a multitude of transition toolkits, including heads which obviously we know is a, a communication tool um, and it's, an, it's like an interview prompt and it gives a real holistic assessment of that young person's biopsychosocial needs the risks and the strengths within that so that we can engage with future interventions um, across the home life education and employment and um, their eating activities drugs sexuality suicide and depression and safety safety as well so that's the the heads framework that he he talked about we also, he also went through the growing up and gaining independence, um, which is a simple framework to enable clinicians to engage and support young people to develop the skills, knowledge and understanding associated with emerging adulthood anyway, regardless of whether they need a transition um, process, even if they haven't got a long term condition. Um, it can be utilised with all our young people moving forward and it can work with other tools as well. So the Ready, Steady, Go, which we'll touch on as well or it can be used as a standalone document. The Ready, Steady, Go 
he, he covered as well, which we know um, probably is the most utilised form because it's um, had a, a tremendous amount of evidence base behind it. And that's a series of questions and statements to prompt discussions. And I think what Nigel was trying to do is implore you to utilise these documents as very much um, as, a, as a communication tool to enable you to have quality conversations with young people and really importantly for you to be able to document and evidence that, that, that you are having those conversations and that they are understanding their health and well-being moving forward. So this can be done online or on paper and it is really widely used and it's so suitable for um, peds and adult services. In terms of resources, it's available there um, as an introductory booklet um, to cover the whole uh, concept of Ready Study Go. And then it looks at different aspects of that young person's transition journey, depending on the age um, spectrum and their readiness to move to that next stage. And really importantly, it includes that hello stage into adult services as well. And what's not actually documented here is that there is also support to transition parents through this, this process as well. And there's eight themes with 35 different statements. And I think as Nigel um, depicted, it doesn't necessarily have to be done in such a systematic way. It is that conversational tool piece um, and you can go back to things and revisit things um, or focus on the areas where that young person perhaps isn't uh, understanding that element of their skills and knowledges that, that, that we, they require. And what can fall out of this is the development of those transition plans. So that's essentially um, what um, transition tools we have within this country, although there are others, obviously the 10 steps from um, Alder Hay as well, which he covered. But last session, he also covered some of the international work that's going through. So the GOTS transition from North America, Trapeze from Sydney and um, Melbourne as well. So he went through each of these processes as well. So it, it's back to that benchmarking aspect that we, we've just talked about in that um, we we know that we need to benchmark within our own services outside of our organisation, but we can also look at um, evidence and uh, experiences and learning from our international colleagues as well. So that's what we covered over all of that those six months period, which is quite a lot, a lot of information. So apologies if that was a bit of an information dump. Um, as I mentioned, it is there to recap on those salient points that we've covered over a six month per, um, period. And hopefully by having a copy of this presentation and be having access to this recording, you can revisit each of those um, as you, you go through. But what we thought would be really useful now is to to understand just what it is that you've gleaned um, from these um, series of events that have we've, have gone on so far. So we'd love I'd come out of the screen now if I can. But if I can ask you then all to join Slido.com as we have done in each of the sessions, we have a, a new code there of one four five four five nine one. And Sarah is kindly going to share that with us now. And we're just going to ask you two questions for now before we hand over to Louise to look at the, the national picture and what's to come for the future for transition. Um, and then um, look at what the um, questions are here. So I'm just going to highlight them to you. So how have we been able to use these sessions to inform your practice? And what aspects of the QI process have you been able to undertake? Um, so I, I, I think we're going to do them as separate ones. We're just going to do these really quickly if we can. I'm, I'm conscious of time because we've had a lot to cover today. Um, so we'll just give it a couple of minutes. Just, you know, one word answers, couple of word answers will be marvellous. And then we can share these with you as part of the ongoing process. Obviously, we'll, we'll look at evaluating this process. And I know Sarah and Sally will be able to share this, the outcome of these moving forward as well. So we've still got people typing there for a couple of minutes. Informative, that's good. <laughs> Let's see if you can remember any of it now. <laughs> but. Um... That's really useful to know. I, I realise that we have 
covered old ground today in that we have revisited every single um, session that we've been through, but there's been a lot of information throughout each of the sessions um, and a lot of um, concepts considered, but hopefully today gives us that those highlights um, and those headlines that we perhaps can utilise to bring forward uh, moving, moving through. So a couple of people He's pinching ideas. That's exactly what we like. We're, we're here to learn, aren't we? Oh, that's really good to hear as well. So some of these, yes, these sessions have helped um, to uh, be able to form a countywide community of practice, looking at the development of a toolkit for learning disabilities and complex needs, which is brilliant. I'm, I'm well aware of that and hopefully that work can be shared across the, the network as well. So just one more minute on this and then um, we'll move on to the next one if we can. Oh, Nigel will be really pleased to know that transition toolkits were, <laughs> were so useful for each other, for everybody, should I say. OK, and we've moved on to the next one then. So how have you been able to, um, so sorry, what aspects of the QI process have you been able to undertake today? This this is, I must say, this question isn't um, here to um, highlight, you know, who's doing brilliantly and who's, who's not. This really is um, to try and understand uh, what it is that has been useful to you um, and which parts of the process that you've been able to undertake today to date so that you can identify where you need to be for the future. So this isn't for our um, benefit. It's not for us to scrutinise or to um, get that big stick or even a carrot. It, it really is there for you to be able to identify uh, what, what areas of the QI process have been um, able to be undertaken so far. So lots of stakeholder analysis and benchmarking, um, which I think uh, at this stage is absolutely pertinent and really appropriate as well. So it's that mapping pathway um, at this stage uh, that we, we've all needed to do. So that's that's really good news to hear. And um, I can't see anybody else type in. So I think that's probably a really good time to hand over to Louise because I think she'll be really pleased to know that people have you um, understood that the QI process has been useful to them. And I think you'll endorse that that stakeholder analysis, that benchmarking and that, that mapping is absolutely the best place to start. So with no further ado, I'd love to hand over to Louise Porter, who is our national lead nurse for transition, um, who's going to have a quick look now over well, for the next half an hour to look at the national picture for transition and uh, what we've learned so far as a network and share some of the highlights with you but also look at what the future for governance um, is um, and how we're actually going to hand over this body of work to you so that all of the amazing work that has gone on ahead of me, because I've only been here 12 months, but um, but you know, with the rest of the network for the past three years, so that you can actually utilise that moving forward. So over to you, Louise, thanks so much. Thanks, Stella. And Stella, can you share the slides for some reason? Yes, um, no more open. Um, so while you're doing that in the background, I can say that I'm being sat here like a proud parent, I have to say. <laughs> it's um, it's really nice to see that everybody is using and finding useful um, kind of the transition quality improvement process because it is a recognised quality improvement process, but it's very specific to transition. So it's really good that you're finding it useful. And um, it's really great to see so many people on the call as well and so many people that I know, um, which is really nice. And some new faces in there too. Um, so, yeah, if you just move to the next slide, please, Stella. Thank you. So some of this um, Stella will have already covered, so we'll kind of move through some of the slides quite um, quickly and some we might just dwell on a little bit longer. Um, the slides will be available afterwards, so they, they will be out there for circulation. And if anybody has any questions, you can either um, put your hand up, put in the chat, or um, if something occurs to you afterwards, then please do just drop me an email. 
and I'm sure that we can address any of the questions that you might have. So Stella did say that, you know, we are the Bidet Transition Nursing Network and um, I've got the slide in just to say thank you to the Bidet Trust because we were the largest um, receivers of a, a grant funding. We got just under 1.4 million to run the network and um, I'm sure you'll um, see when we um, move through the slides today that it has been money well spent because you guys have all been out there doing so much hard work and it's absolutely brilliant to see um, kind of the measures that we've got in for um, all three years really. We've had um, improvement um, year on year which is absolutely incredible and they are so happy to see transition being embedded within organisations because it's been so difficult up to this point. Next slide please Stella. So yeah, where we started, Stella has um, already touched on this, that we were, we were a three year project um, following my three years of being funded at least teaching hospitals to improve transition there. Um, I came up with this quality improvement process, which was the only way that I could see that we could make change and sustain change over time. Um, so we had funding to roll that out across England. So it was about rolling out that quality improvement process and kind of that model for improvement. But it was also really, um, looking at the effectiveness of it because I tested it in, in an acute hospital but what we didn't know is um, actually would that translate into other organisations so would it work in the community would it work in a DGH or um, you know in primary care so that was kind of the new ground that we were starting to cover so as you know that we've got the um, team of researchers at the University of Surrey headed up by Professor Faith Gibson um, who works across Great Ormond Street and the University of Surrey um, so they're leading the evaluation and, and Pip has been employed to um, manage that work stream of our project as well. Um, and they will continue with their work until 2024. So if anybody's involved in um, kind of being a case study organisation to look at the effectiveness of the model in the, in the role of the regional nurse advisors, that will continue um, until next year. Because um, obviously when you're evaluating anything, you need to let the project run first and um, let it organically grow and then look at um, the impact of that. So next slide, please, Stella. So we are glad that the researchers are carrying on for a little bit longer. Thank you, Stella. So, yeah, like I said, you know, the purpose was to roll out that quality improvement process, but it was also really to influence the care of all young people because transition cannot be looked at in isolation. We need to get developmentally appropriate healthcare right and transition's an element of that. So we really needed to drive that message that we need to do something different for young people. They are different to children and adults and they have specific needs. So it was trying to get that message across to as many people as possible to try and influence the care of all young people and then work with transition alongside that. We're working with kind of specified stakeholder groups. So I've kind of just mentioned a few of them. So we were testing out whether this works in other organisations. So we were doing hospitals, community, primary care, mental health, learning disabilities. Um, and palliative and hospice care. You'd think I'd know them all off, off the top of my head by three years, wouldn't you? How could I forget one? Um, and what we were trying to do was increase the number of pathways that were out there and being used for transition. And so that's what you were looking at, that quality improvement process was developing pathways or improving pathways. And we also wanted to influence the number of transition lead roles that were across the country because we know where we've got a transition lead role, then we get much more impact across a whole organisation. We get consistency and we also get sustainability. Um, so where we've got that role, we, we could see that improvements were much quicker and lasted longer. Um, so we wanted to influence how many we had. We also wanted to work with NHS Improvement and NHS England to remove some of those high level barriers to transition. So as much as you could work as hard as you wanted to work in developing your pathways and trying to implement them without removing some of those high level barriers, you were never going to be able to achieve that. And I just kind of learned what they were from working as a transition lead within an organisation. So I was taking the knowledge that I had of all the headaches that I had and took them to an HSE and said, look, we need to sort these out. So um, I'll come on to those a little bit later about how we kind of broke them down into work streams and task and finish groups, really. Next slide, please, Stella. So we have, we should have four regional nurse advisors, but, you know, um, it's GCSE season, isn't it? And I'm sure you can count the six there, not, for, not four. So actually, we have had change in regional nurse advisors. As you know, we had the lovely Lucy Duncan to start off with and um, for the first two years for the South, and then Stella joined us for the final year, which has been amazing. And I'm sure you'll agree, Stella's done fantastic job of picking up that work and running with it and 
um, learning very rapidly about where everybody was up to and helping you move forward. So we are very grateful to Stella for being such a quick learner and being so great at settling into the team. We also had another change. So we had Gisette near Kindy um, for the first year for the North and then um, Emma came and joined us. So we've had two years with Emma. So Stella's already said, and I'm sure you're very well aware, you know, that what they were offering was practical help an overview of transition as a whole across the region and joining that up across the country and expert knowledge. Next slide, please, Stella. So we were split into four regions, which was a big headache for the regional nurse advisors, I'm sure you were aware. So when we applied, there was only four regions, which is why we went with four regions. We did soon realise that NHS England was soon to split into seven regions, but we didn't change that because we were asking for a lot of money as it was, and we knew that we wouldn't get a bid through if we changed the seven regions, so we stuck with the four. And actually, at the end of the project, they do have a different opinion. So if anybody knows Nathan and if anybody was at the conference, you'll realise that Nathan was really upset about having the East of England and the Midlands. But now you can't get it off him. He absolutely loves the fact that he had that huge region and actually it worked in his favour. And he did a fantastic job working across um, the whole of the middle of England is how I like to see it. But we can't call the East of England Midlands. Apparently that's really offensive. <laughs> so, so he did have his two regions working as one. Next slide, please, Donna. So just to kind of give you an overview, um, kind of this point in time of how much impact we've had across the stakeholder groups. Now, I told you that there was kind of six or seven stakeholder groups that we were looking at, but we, we've kind of got them as four on here because community, we've had to lump in um, learning disabilities and mental health to that because they're not standalone organisations in many cases they're kind of meshed in with either acute services or community services so for the purposes of measurement we've put them into community and we have had a bit of a problem trying to tease out where we're up to from a year three figures so that figure is in white because that has not changed from year two that was year two's figures the others that are in blue in that middle circle are the percentages for this year so of 432 um, hospitals across England, we've been working with 61% of them and hospices were just under 40%. Community, as you can see, we were at 44%. We will be at more than that at the minute, but we just haven't worked out what that figure is just yet. Um, and GP practices, we were only at 0.04 because actually we realised early on that we couldn't target individual GP practices and what we actually needed to do was work with the Royal College of GPs and work at that strategic level to look at actually what they need because they need something slightly different and they need a model of care for young people rather than um, an actual transition pathway through each GP um, surgery. So um, that work is still ongoing and we still I'm still having conversations with Steph Lamb who's now the lead um, from Royal College of GPs and we're trying to progress that work and try and get some sustainability with that moving forward along with NHS England. Next slide please Stella. So from a measures point of view, I'm sure you're aware that we were measuring the impact that we had as a um, national team and as regional nurse advisors. So we need to look at actually what impact are we having, um, you know, across the regions and across the country to say actually is transition improving? So we set out eight measures that we wanted to look at really to look at actually the impact of um, some kind of change at patient level. Um, so we first one wanted to look at um, the number of transition lead roles and the reasons for that is I've already said, you know, we know that where we've got one, we have um, a broader and um, much more in-depth impact within an organisation. So you'll see the colours depict where we were at within the position of the project. So grey is pre-project, the darker blue is year one, then we've got a year two and year three. And you'll see that all of the measures have increased year on year. So we started off with 21 um, transition leads. So these are whole organisation transition leads. So this isn't just somebody who's identified within an organisation as a contact and they might be leading transition from one service point of view. This is somebody who's employed to do that job across a whole organisation. So we have moved to a position where we're at now with 115. And I have to say, when I started out as a transition lead in 2015, there was only actually three of us. Um, so that's a huge increase over the years. And then looking at the organisations that were working through that quality improvement process, there were seven pre-project. The reason for that was because we'd been doing the work in Leeds, so we had managed to influence a few organisations within the North and they'd started kind of working through that already. 
but we're now at a point of having 198 organisations that are working through that, that process, which is really, really good. And then the number of organisations with a transition contact, you'll have no idea how difficult it was to try and find transition contacts. Regional nurse advisor, I think they nearly went grey trying to find people and the right person to talk to. So they have got around about 551 now. So you can imagine that's a lot of people to keep in contact with. So they've been incredibly busy having um, conversations, um, you know, multiple conversations on a daily basis about transition and where people are up to and how to help them support them moving forward and trying to buddy people up as well. And then number four was the number of organisations with an exec lead. So that kind of sits in partnership with the transition lead. So where you've got exec buy-in and you've got a lead on the exec board and you've got transition lead, we know that that's kind of a winning combination because you can have a transition lead, but they might be kind of sat in, in isolation and working in a bit of a silo and not being able to move things forward because they haven't got the backing of somebody quite senior to unblock some of those barriers. So I know that we've got some transition leads on, on the call today and, and they will feel it. You know, these are quite isolating roles sometimes and you feel like nobody understands where you're coming from. Um, so it is really helpful to have buy-in from the exec team. So we've had good increase as well, up to 122. And health earth use workers is always a challenge. Everybody wants them, but it's so incredibly difficult to get them because usually you have to fund them through pump prime funding, through charities then prove the need, evaluate the role, and then um, hopefully you get funding from the organisation. So we've had a slower increase with youth workers. It's not because we don't want them. Um, it is just because it is really challenging because we haven't moved to a place at the minute where healthcare realise how useful um, youth workers are um, at kind of that senior level to be able to just fund them as we do with player staff. Next slide, please, Stella. And that would be my ambition to get to that state where we we do have teams of youth workers within organisations that are like the player teams. So this is the measures that are just broken down into the regions. Um, so I'm not expecting you to see it on here. The slides will be circulated, as, as I've said, and um, it just breaks them down into the regions. So you can see your regional split for all of those measures. And obviously it's not identifying individual organisations. It is just numbers of overall. Next slide, please, Stella. So the other measures that we looked at, and they're a little bit out of order, is because um, these were the harder ones to collect. So we had to wait a couple of more months to the end of the project really to collect these. So the number of quality improvement pathways that have been completed. Um, so pre-project, we did have some, obviously, because we've been doing the work in Leeds and other organisations had started doing some. Um, it takes a long time. So if you think about the country and think, oh, we've only got 302 pathways and it doesn't sound very much, it's because I know from, you know, working on pathways, you'll know, you know, all of you on this call were saying you'd only just got to benchmarking and you've been on this for like six months. It takes a long time and you've got to stick at it. It's a, it's a long process because you've got to include children's and adult services. You've got to have those joint conversations and it takes a while to unpick what you're already doing, let alone to benchmark and then look at kind of a future state and then putting business cases together and moving forward to some solutions. So I think the quicker service that I did once I got a little bit slicker at it um, was probably about six to seven months. And that was with an org with the service who were pretty engaged with transition and already doing something. I think the longest service that I had on was three years. Um, so it can take quite a while. So we will see that hopefully keep going up over the next few years. Measure seven was around the number of organisations with processes in place to use the feedback of young people to support service improvement. And this was really important because I think there's a lot of goodwill out there and there's um, work to improve pathways. But I think there was, there was missing link with some services and some organisations that they weren't asking the young people. So they said, oh, you've got brilliant pathway. But actually, then when you look at what the young people are experiencing, it isn't what they what they think that they're getting. So the the professionals were saying, oh yeah, we're offering really good service and we're holding on to them because they're not ready. But actually, young people were saying, well, no, we wanted to go. We feel ready. So actually, you know, who was who was making that assumption for me? And actually, where was my assessment? So it's really good to get feedback from the young people to say actually if what we're doing is having a positive effect or actually if it's inadvertently disadvantaging people from the changes that we've actually made. 
And then measure eight was the number of organisations with um, governance processes in place. So have we got transition boards, steering groups? Have we got um, kind of policies and reporting processes in place? And we've seen a really good increase in that as well. Next slide, please, Stella. So this is just been broken up into graph form, really, and it's broken up into regions. So you can have a look. So for you in the south, you're in purple. So you can see year on year as we move across to the right of the screen, we've got increases. So you can quite quickly flip through these, Stella. So that was the pathways. The next one was um, the process in place for feedback for young people. And the next one, Stella. So that was governance processes as well. So you see there's been good increase um, from the south. So our experience was telling us that, you know, there was these high level barriers that were in place and we needed to remove them, like I've said. So the high level barriers were really that there wasn't funding, there wasn't any money for transition, there wasn't enough of the right people in the right place at the right time. We didn't have the right environment and the right resources. Um, we don't understand always the needs of young people. Um, so there was no consistent training or routine training across um, England and there was no assessment of skills. And there wasn't really consistent in inspection. So there is con in inspection of children's services, but it wasn't really consistent. It depends on who the inspection team were in, in their areas of interest or specialty. Um, and adult services weren't really being inspected for the care of young people or transition at all. And there wasn't really routine monitoring or assurance or data gathering within organisations either around transition or young people. Next slide, please, Stella. So as I've said, um, you know, we needed to tackle that. So the, the gaps in many of you will have seen this iceberg before. So the gaps are on the right hand side. And that was all the work that we needed to do below the waterline of that iceberg before we could actually say that transition is being delivered at the top of that iceberg. So we had a lot of work to do. Next slide, please, Stella. So we did work alongside NHS Improvement originally to set up the transition collaborative to start off with engagement and try and start sharing that quality improvement process and get engagement buy-in from the exec teams um, and try to understand what we needed for um, transition the project work and the quality improvement teams going into um, kind of the next stage of the project, which was kind of into year two and into year three, and working with NHS England to remove some of these high level barriers. So these were the work streams really that came out of that trying to remove um, the barriers. So we have got um, the National Framework for Transition that was developed by Katie Puplett, who was um, in the policy team in the transformation, CYP transformation team at NHS England. So we um, helped to produce that and gave some expert advice on, on that framework. The core capabilities um, was the assessment of skills of staff, and it was any staff. Um, across organisations. So it was at any level. So it could be from admin staff porters right up to consultants or execs. So we wanted to be able to assess the knowledge and skills that staff needed to have to care for young people um, fundamentally and to deliver transition as well. So that came out of one of our advisory groups that was saying, you know, we need to have this assessment of skills. So um, we did get funding from NHS England and they paid for Skills for Health to work alongside us to develop that core capabilities. Um, it's not called a framework now because we had two frameworks, so we've dropped the name framework, but originally it was called a framework. So it's core capabilities document now. Um, and we did need um, a national training package and that's in the process at the minute. Um, and we're just waiting for e-learning for health to um, develop the storyboards for that and, and move that piece of work forward to develop the package to go alongside um, the assessment with the core capabilities. We also didn't have funding, so it was working alongside um, NHS England to develop the, the funding um, streams for transition, which we've never had before. And alongside funding comes a transition code, which makes me hugely excited. And every time I present this, I do say how excited I am. Because as a transition lead, that was the hardest thing, was not being able to easily identify how many patients we had in transition. And if you can't quantify the volume of patients, you can't quantify the need for resource and you can't identify risk either. But you also can't scrutinise where things might have gone wrong. So I think the transition code is going to be the turning point for the future. So I am really excited that that's coming. And core writing and briefing paper with the CQC as well, that makes me quite excited. I'm sure it doesn't make you guys excited because it means they're going to be looking at you, but it should be looking at you in 
kind of a supportive way. So I always see inspections as um, an opportunity. So it might come back that you've kind of got had a negative inspection, but actually that is a driver for change. And it definitely worked with Leeds. And that's how my role came about was um, it was the perfect storm where we'd had an incident with a patient in transition. There was somebody who was keen to um, share knowledge and skills around um, the care of young people. So we had an expert advisor for the care of young people. And then we had um, a poor CQC rating for transition in the care of young people. Um, so all of that meant that they had to do something about it. So we did get funding to change, which was great. It's always the silver lining. Next slide, please, Stella. So just thinking about um, best practice. So from um, care of young people and, and transition point of view, this is what we're aiming for, for everybody. So we should have developmentally appropriate health care for all young people um, or for all people. And young people are a part of developmentally appropriate health care. So getting it right for young people, first and foremost. For those who've got a long term condition um, that are moving from children's adult services, we need to ensure that transition preparation and support is there for the 11 to 25 year olds. They may not need it up to 25. They need it until they're embedded within the adult service and they're engaging with the adult service. That could be for some around about 2021. 20, for others, it might be up to 25. And then we also need appropriate care for the newly presenting adolescents, sometimes called the crash landers. So the ones that are diagnosed between that kind of 16 to 18, so they go straight into the adult service, they're not known to the children's service, so they don't need transition support, but they still need that specific support as a young person with a condition in an adult service. So along the right hand side there, we've got um, the guidance to support that um, of achieving best practice. So the, you've got documents there like the national um, training package that will be coming. Um, you'll have the national framework for transition as well. You will have the core capabilities. We've already got the benchmarks and we've already got nice guidance as well. And what I'd say is don't wait for everything coming out because everything is based around the nice guidance. So nice guidance is the gold standard. Um, so don't worry about, you know, oh, we've got to wait for the core capabilities to come out. I think actually just use the nice guidance and use the benchmarks for now and you won't go far wrong. And when the core capabilities come, you can use that to help support some of the gaps that you will have already identified um, from kind of training and education needs. Next slide, please, Stella. So we've already mentioned the long term plan. Stella mentioned the long term plan um, and actually does mention um, the fact that we don't want to lose anybody in transition, um, but also talks about selectively moving to not 25 services. So when I came into post as national lead, I was kind of being a bit quizzical and asking, what do we mean by that? Um, and I don't think they actually fully knew what they meant by selectively moving to 0 to 25 services because we couldn't move everybody into 0 to 25 services and develop these new services. And actually what they probably meant and what I took from it was actually we need to have better ways of communicating and more seamless moves between the services for people in transition. So we've got an umbrella there that covers developmentally appropriate healthcare for all. And then we've got examples of the different service um, setups and, and service pathways really um, for that 0 to 25 approach. So we've got examples of lifelong services. So that could be a GP, it could be the cleft lip and palate services. So they don't change the person, but they change the service. Um, and then, sorry, they don't change the person or change the service, they keep them. Then we've got 0 to 25 services that then go into an adult service. And then we've got children's into adults, which is the most common. And then we've got things like the oncology services where we've got children's and then we've got a young adult um, or a teenage and then young adult service and then into an adult service. So they're just different examples. Um, and we need to have that seamless move. Next slide, please, Stella. So the core capabilities I've already touched on. Um, and Basically, that was just an assessment, a way of assessing the skills that all staff need to have. So it's knowledge, skills and behaviours and attitudes of staff split up into different um, tiers. So tier one is for all those um, who are looking after young people. So anybody who's in, got involvement with a young person. Tier two is anybody who's delivering transition. And tier three is anybody with a role that is a transformational leadership role around transition. Um, so you should be able to know where you're at and work to that tier. 
These are examples of the capability headings. So there's 14 of them. Under the capability headings are capability statements. So you look at the statement and you say, can I make that statement? What evidence have I got to say that I make that statement? If I don't, then that's a gap and what do I want to do about it? So it's a way of you assessing yourself as an individual, or it could be a way of assessing a team of staff. So it might be a matron looking at, you know, a set of their staff, or it could be um, a ward manager looking at their staff or a community, could be anybody um, looking at staff groups and saying, actually, what skills do we need for these roles? Next slide, please, Stella. I can't give you a date for the, the core capabilities coming out. I know people are going to ask me that, but I can't. It's um, in the hands of NHS England, and I am just told constantly that it's coming soon. So that's all I can tell you. So why so many documents? Well, some of them cover process, some of them cover the skills of staff and some of them cover knowledge. Um, so that's why we've got the different ones. And the ones that we've discussed today, the, the key ones are the process that you've been talking about. So nice guidance, send code of practice, your benchmarks um, and the national framework will cover process. Um, capabilities, so obviously skills and knowledge will be the training packets and, and you're welcome. Next slide, please, Stella. These are the people that we've been working with and they we're hugely grateful to them. So, you know, a big shout out to the hospices, um, you know, to Together for Short Lives and the Queen's Nursing Institute. We've done a lot of work together um, and it's been absolutely great. We've helped um, update service specifications, update documents um, and, you know, deliver presentations and, and acted as expert advisors for them too. Next slide, please, Stella. Um, NCPOD, so the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcomes and Deaths, they've got a research study that's been ongoing for three years. It's just about to come to its conclusion and we're expecting the recommendations to come out in June of this year. And they've basically been looking into the barriers to transition. So what barriers are in place at the minute to stop transition being implemented? Next slide, please, Stella. Um, MedTech, so that is the National Institute of Health Research. They've got two work streams ongoing. They've got videos project, which we will let you know as soon as those videos are out because they're for national use. And they're trying to put um, a digital app together for a patient evaluation tool that was based on Mind the Gap um, that was developed by Janet McDonough, which is a patient evaluation of transition and the benchmarks as well, which is process. Next slide, please, Stella. Um, me first, people will know about. So that's a training um, program which includes transition and the fundamentals um, of young people's um, communication. So it's not transition training, it is communication training. Anybody interested in that, drop Stella an email or myself an email and we'll put you in touch with um, the team at Great Ormond Street. It's absolutely fantastic. Next slide, please, Stella. Together for Short Lives, Stella's already mentioned the guide to stepping up. We've been involved in um, consulting on that and that's just been updated and come out this year. So it's a brilliant guide. If anybody's not used it, then please do have a look. And the ECHO um, project has come to a conclusion, but it is still ongoing. So the ECHO sessions are still happening over the three sites. Um, so that's Soland, Keach Hospice, and um, it's in Leeds as well. Next slide, please, Stella. Um, this, I've just kept this in because um, this was the commitment around ensuring that by 2028, no child or young person will be lost between the gaps between children's and adult services. It's a big ask. You know, you need to think about actually, can we monitor and can we deliver on that at the minute? Have we got assurance that we know that nobody's getting lost? So that's really the starting point for anybody in the next steps is actually how do we monitor our patients and how do we identify um, and flag patients in transition to make sure that we are achieving that ambition as well. Next slide, please, Stella. So the network has been a success. You know, we've had many conferences, we've had huge engagement, and it's all thanks to you guys. You know, you've been absolutely amazing, um, you know, working with us and to the regional nurse advisors who've been doing the hard work with me in the background, just kind of coordinating things and trying to um, have some higher level conversations with NHSE. So, you know, we have had some absolutely brilliant events and I hope that they have been useful to everybody. So we've been trying to work in partnership with you as providers with NHS England and ourselves. Next slide, please, Dylan. Just thinking about next steps now. So really, um, I've got funding for another six months to hand over the work that um, we've been doing. So the regional nurse advisors have mapped the landscape of transition across their regions. So I'm just trying to put that together into 
simple to understand document so you can see where everybody's up to and it isn't about judgment it's about actually how can we help and support you moving forward so where is everybody up to and where are the gaps where do we need to kind of target some support um, and identify where we might need to kind of link people up um, and you know how can we direct funding as well where we're looking at commissioning as well so it's supposed to be a very supportive approach it's not about telling people that they're doing things wrong um, the regional nurse advisors obviously have come to the end of their um, work and we are hugely grateful to all of them, each and every one of them. They've done a fantastic job. Um, and what we want to do is not lose the work that they've um, been tirelessly um, you know, seeking to achieve over the last three years. So we want them to pick up their work and move it forward. We don't want to lose it and start from scratch again. Um, so I'll be supporting NHS England to develop the next step. So identifying um, who needs to be in their um, steering group and how do we disseminate this information across in, in England into the ICBs, into the regions and into provider organisations. So that's kind of in discussion phase at the moment, um, rapidly moving into um, implementation. And we're also um, obviously got the research team that will be evaluating and um, working until 2024. So there'll be lots of documents that will be produced and um, published. So there'll be lots of journal articles coming out um, and we'll be able to share that information with you and any recommendations that come from that. Um, next slide, please, Stella. So it was just to really say a thank you to the team um, and just to see so you can see how big the team was. So the research team are in the middle. We've had two expert advisors, my line manager on the right and the operational team on the left there. Um, and next slide is just my contact details. Oh, it should be questions and then contact details if anybody wanted to get in touch. So I have kind of speeded through that last bit because I just wanted to leave enough time for questions really, Stella, and see if anybody had any questions or concerns. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, uh, Louise. Um, obviously, uh, the whole body of work has been um, a real catalyst, I think, to change in the world of transition. We we know that nothing happened for decades, and it certainly feels like over the past three years, it's come on leaps and bounds. And from my perspective, it's been an absolute privilege to be, be part of that process. Um, and I think everybody felt uh, will feel that it was great to see and understand the the background that went ahead of this and to see that bigger picture of what all of the other processes that you're involved with as, as a national lead nurse to make sure that transition is that golden thread through all services moving forward for the future so thank you very much for that uh, i'm really conscious we're short of time but if there, if there is any questions for louise um do you want to pop your hands up if not we can perhaps take them at the end I've not managed to have a look at the chat because I was um, going through. Um, no, there isn't any in the chat, Stella. OK, that's fine. You've you've um, lulled them into absolute silence with all that amazing work. So fa fabulous. Thank you so much. So really, that just leaves us to um, wrap up the sessions, essentially. And I just wanted to recap um, on some bits and pieces, um, which is not that one. I do apologise. Hang on a second. Try again. Can you see the screen there? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so obviously we've we've had the slido. So um this series of um, webinars has to embed, has been there to highlight transition and how it can be embedded within your own organisations um, in a quality uh, with a quality approach to reach that gold standard. And we know, and again, I won't go through all of these. We've touched on these before. What those best practice principles are for transition, um, and as we say, these slides are available. Um, it feels quite daunting. Every, we've talked about so much today, but if you can remember back to session one when we actually talked about the um, project plan for services, we this is available um, as um, a separate slide for you to think about how you are actually going to embed this moving forward. And it is broken down and gives some really good 
practical advice of where to start and um, what to do at the next stage of each process. Um, we will we will look at this um, in a second. We need to understand what your priorities are going to be to embed those transition services in the future. And I know that Sally and um, Sarah are really keen to understand that. So we'll come back to that as the final point towards the end. But I just wanted to reiterate, you know, where we can start um, in terms of how we start this process, because it does feel quite daunting. So first of all, we need to look at what the look of transition looks within your own organisations. Think about how many services that we're going to need to build transition pathways for. And really importantly, because we know about the mortality and morbidity rates for poor transition, we need to understand what the risk is and that that risk has potentially been identified within your own organisations. And then we're going to need to think about how we monitor this progress and, and um, how we're embedding these services. So, you know, we need those um, codes uh, moving forward. And I can see why Louise is so excited about it, because it's the area that most people really struggle with. If we don't know what our services look like, then we can't map them, we can't scope them for the future, and we can't make sure that our um, services are fit for purpose, essentially. Um, so we need to understand that. And we've also touched on today what the guidance is currently. So that nice guidelines, the NG34 are our gold standards for the moment, but they will be supported with all the new documents that Louise has managed to um, talk us through as well today. So, you know, you will be um, guided uh, for where that scrutiny is going to come with um, for the future. And we need to understand with that, you know, what our key performance indicators are going to be within each organisation and what it is that you want to measure and what you want to report on moving forward. So I suppose our call to action is here. As you'll remember, at each stage of these sessions, we have had a call to action um, for you to think about what we're going to do for the next session. Well, this is the final point from ourselves from a Bidet point of view, but it isn't a final point for the um, South Thames Paediatric Network or you as in individual providers and specialists within transition. So these are just some of the ideas that we um, have touched upon throughout the sessions about how and where to start um, and the call to action. So it's very much about that stakeholder analysis point of view um, and who those movers and shakers are. It's about mapping your services, looking at the current state and really aiming for that gold standard for your future pathway development and using those benchmarking tools to actually um, guide you as to where do you need to prioritise um, moving forward. And it might be the development of those key P KPIs uh, to ensure that you're um, absolutely embedding an effective and sustainable service moving forward. So we'll um, nip back to the Slido, um, if we can, um, Sarah, if I could ask you to, to go to the Slido um, and just ask that final question. So I'll just stop sharing there. Oh, you, you've already come through. And whilst this is on, then um, we really appreciate we're a, a minute over time. But if you wouldn't mind just thinking about what your key priorities are going to be in order to embed this transition into your services for the future. And uh, we've heard so much, but I'm sure there's areas you've thought to yourself as the, the presentations have gone on. Do you know what? I could really make a difference by just taking that aspect and running with it. And then that will lead to the next part of the process. Um, and that might be looking at your stakeholders. It might mean who's on your side. It might be engaging your execs, as somebody's put there. It might be actually doing a business case for uh, a transition lead. Um, but we, it, it, this is a call to action for you to start that process now and really make a difference, not just to your service and your organisation, but most importantly, to those young people and stop those young people falling off that cliff edge for the future and come into harm as a result of a poor poor transition. So yeah, I can see a few people typing there. I just want to thank Sarah and Sally um, for all of their support and collaboration in making this what I think is a, a really success, successive 
and um, successful transition webinar series that hopefully has equipped you all with some knowledge and skills to actually run away run um, in your organisations with it. And also thank Louise Porter here today as well as our national nurse, who, as she says, is available for the next six months to look at that handover process um, and um, all of the good work that has gone on ahead hopefully will not be lost uh, as a result of the network um, coming to its, its uh, natural conclusion because it was a three-year project um, but it's how to embed this body of work now moving forward so that you can utilize all of the resources that have have gone before us so that's me i don't know if that's sorry you want to say anything at all from um on behalf of the south thames pediatric network um well really it's just about what we want to do after this and we have a um we have a hold in the diary in june for a transition forum so hopefully that'll be where we sort of continue all this work um and that'll be the, the key thing now we really just want to thank you and nigel you've been fantastic without you i don't think we could have done any of this so obviously um so although I'm managing it behind the scenes, we need you guys to really help deliver this, which is why it's a bit scary you're going. <laughs> but um, hopefully all will be well after and you can all rely on each other. Um, is the is the plan, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, and just in terms of an evaluation, just so people are aware, I think it's done now, Bab. People have, um, I've, I oh, don't know how many people have ribs are still here, but um, I am planning to also send out an evaluation form to everyone who's been attending these. Um, so hopefully we can get some sort of feedback from all the webinars. Um, so just watch this space and then after filling those out and getting feedback back, we can hopefully issue some certificates as well. Of people attending these QR webinars, which would be really good. Thank you so much, Sarah. So are there any questions? I realise we're just four minutes over time, but if there are, are any questions, we're happy to take them. I don't think we have. That's absolutely perfect. Just some lovely comments in, in the chat. So thank you to everybody. Have a lovely afternoon. I hope the sun does come up your way from, from the southwest. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, and an absolute privilege working with you all. And I hope our paths will cross again in the future. Thank you so much.